live from CUBE headquarters in Palo Alto, California. It's the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Hello everyone, you're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier, November 11th, here in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto. And joining today is my guest Jeff Frick and Tom Joyce, uh, former executive at EMC and Dell EMC, now out looking and talking to everyone in Silicon Valley. And uh, this is the show titled today is Massive Disruption. Um, obviously the world has disrupted the election on Tuesday. Donald Trump is the president-elect of the United States. I actually take a screenshot and say like, I just couldn't believe I on the screen, Donald Trump, next US president. I was just blown away. Now you told me 20 years ago, Donald Trump was gonna be the president. I told you two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, I mean, well, thanks for coming in. Appreciate yeah, you being our guest right today. Here. Talk about the impact on technology industry, obviously mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, talking to a lot of the VCs. Uh, uh, looking for your next opportunity, you're talking to everybody. But you know, you were involved in the Dell EMC merger, which I got completely wrong. I told Stu there's no way. In fact, EMC might buy Dell. Completely wrong on that. Yesterday last week I was saying Hillary Clinton was gonna run the table on Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump wins, although I had a feeling that could happen, but I had no I completely thought he was gonna never get it. In fact, after the, that so-called, you know, uh, uh, tape in the in the van about women, I'm like this absolutely he's dead in the water. I think, I think Hillary kind of thought the same thing. So we're going to talk about the election. There's really nothing else to talk about. Um, there is uh, you know, some highlights. I did have a sit down on Monday night with Andy Jassy, the CEO, an exclusive one-on-one -on -one in Seattle. And we were up there for the Cloud Native Conference, which is about developers. And certainly that's a big disruption story, but overshadowed by the election, Jeff. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I think it, it is amazing. It shows that nothing is, nothing is safe. And I think what people are, are losing in kind of the 50-50 split of the people is that Trump, you know, he, he, uh, he beat the Republican Party too, if you recall. Mm. They weren't behind him. And he beat the Democratic Party. And he beat the, the kind of the classic East Coast uh, media. So it's really, I think, a statement on people are kind of pissed <clears throat> off with the status quo, regardless of your sides, because the Republicans weren't behind him either. This is not a Republican victory. It's really, I think, a referendum on the old ways, and people are ready for a real change. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. I mean, I think looking at the Facebook feed, my wife Linda was distraught. I mean, she was, you know, uh, emotionally torn. That's, that's what everyone else was there protesting, and no one even knows what they're protesting. But obviously, Trump did not resonate with, with women, obviously, that was clear. And my Facebook feed is lighting up with people outraged by this and um but you know the, the issue is is that how did this happen i mean the, you, know, you look at what happened you know i you know i've posted on facebook and mean a lot of engagement on i mean i wrote this morning journalism needs a spanking big time because they were part of it i mean mm -hmm. they were clearly promoting trump i mean hillary and i think that resonated with the opposition I think Silicon Valley also was heavily on Hillary. Well, you know, I mean, I will tell you, flying back and forth to Texas in my last job every couple of weeks, you get different perspectives. And my whole family lives in Florida. And, you know, they're all older people and they're retired and they're, they're on fixed incomes and so forth. But even with that, talking to people that were for Trump, I had no clue. I couldn't conceive of Trump winning if, you know, because of all yeah. of the input that we got. Right, I mean, sometimes right. you're living in this echo chamber and you wonder if out here we got it wrong. But the reality is I don't think people in Texas or Florida or a lot of these other places even – even if they intended to vote for Trump, thought it would happen. So it was a huge miss. Well, the other thing I think it came up, we were talking to Bev Crayer at Grace Hopper, and I think it was a really insightful observation that she made. We're, we're, we like tech, right? Amazon recommendation engine shows you things that it thinks you like based on other things that mm. you've bought. In the media now, we're getting the same thing. Your recommended stories are probably based on the stories in which you've already clicked on. So you get this polarization on the edges to get self-reinforcing things. And Bev made an interesting statement. When the main media was the newspaper and we all read the same one, they had to be more centrist because everybody read the same article. Mm. doesn't happen anymore. Now you can just get your own echo chamber mm -hmm. regardless of the point of view in which you, you hold. And the algorithms, there's a lot of knock on Facebook. You know, those well, things had are fake supporting news. that. Facebook right? was actually getting dinged for fake news. Zuckerberg was actually defending well, it last night on, on his live feed. But essentially, no, they... They're getting called out for fake news. CNN just actually got called out for staging a fake interview. Um, the media fail. I think Silicon Valley failed big time. Data big time. science failed. I mean, where the hell's Nate Silver? He completely so much for missed big data, it. right? Big data has failed. So you know, this is an absolute change in my mind. Forget all that the politics aside and and and, and what Trump's all about. To me, this is actually a signal of where the path's going. We talked about it last week. Right. WikiLeaks exposing data data-driven world, and I think the journalism piece really highlights the fact that it's a failed model. But the, the, the data thing is interesting, though, because what doesn't come up enough in the big data discussion is how to lie with statistics. I mean, there's you can, you can get any 
um, uh, hypothesis supported with statistics. You have so much data now. You watch the sports, you know, the, the Durant and Curry are the highest scoring pair after an Olympic season within the first 10 games of the season who haven't played on a Sunday yet. I mean, the ridiculousness in which you can support any hypothesis based on the power today, it just set up, reinforces this echo chamber. Like mm. you said, Tom, it's easy mm. to support your own view, even with data. Well, there's yeah. a lot of group think. I mean, this is what you're talking mm. about. On Facebook, you get the bubble and you get the self-reinforcing. Oh, Hillary's going to win. In fact, at uh, when I was in Seattle, we were up there watching the election results come in at, a, at an event with uh, Cloud Native, which is a developer conference. They had TVs up, and it was very celebratory. Everyone's mm. like, hey, we're going to celebrate Hillary's win. It went from, it, like, wait a minute, to shock, anger, and then everyone went back to their room. It was it was an absolute crater. Everyone thought Hillary was going to win, and you break that down. You say, you know, what happened? Um, you know, my take on it, obviously, is is the resonant with the with the middle middle of America. But if you look at California, which clearly won with Hillary, and if you look at the East Coast, you can see the differences, right? There's pretty much red everywhere. But California, obviously all blue, is actually stepping out and people are saying, hey, we should s separate from the union mm -hmm. and break up into six uh, different states. Which I find ridiculous. But. It's ridiculous, yeah. Well, what's the irony, right? One of the ironies is one of the, the, the big signature moments of the debates was when Hillary asked Donald, will you accept failure graciously? Will you accept loss graciously? And when he didn't respond with the right answer, there was a huge hubbub. Well, now the, turn, the tables have been flipped and people are not accepting defeat graciously. A lot of people are. I'm actually surprised at the number of people who are not happy about the results that are still publishing posts saying, you know, we're in this together, we're still one country, it's part of what makes us great, we have to move forward. So yeah. that's encouraging, but a lot of people are not ex not acting in the same behavior they would have expected the other side to do. I mean, let's, let's talk about the impact, guys, on this, because I mean, one of the things I look at right now is post-election, you really can't do anything. It was how our governed state works, our country works. Uh, it was not a rigged election, uh, as people were saying, it was actually vote. Trump has a mandate to govern. So I personally respect that, but you know, I'm not, I'm not happy with the results personally, and other people aren't, but what does it really mean? And I look at people in two perspectives. Are you um, causing a civil war kind of behavior, or are you say, admitting it and then getting involved? Because there's two types of people out there that I'm seeing on, on in the social networks. People who are just enraged, you know, they, they will go against the system, but they'll do it in a violent way, versus others are saying, hey, I'm pissed off, let's dig in and try to get more involved and make a change. So I think the impact of this is going to be one on a societal basis. Mm. The political science and social science couldn't have been more ex exciting in terms of helping change the direction, but also the technology imp uh, industry is going to be impacted. So, you know, Silicon Valley certainly put, went all in on Hillary, and I'm wondering what the impact, the backlash is with Trump. <clears throat> Outside of Peter Thiel, no one was supporting Trump, at least publicly. Mm. Your thoughts on impact of the industry? Well, you know, I think uh, at our age, right, it's different than these kids, you know, the folks that are early stage, you know, young engineers, young people in, in the startup community. They haven't had a loss like this. <laughs> you know, over 35 years of voting, we've all lost. Everybody's experienced what happens. You get four years or eight years of a person you don't like in the White House, right. and life, go life goes on. You go back yeah. to work. You may not like how things turn out, but you go to work the next day. And, you know, I didn't have a job this time, but I still went to work. <laughs> I went out and started to meet with people. And, you know, under underneath this, it's, it's really a separate phenomenon that the technology disruption is happening, is unstoppable, will continue to happen almost regardless. Now, the economics may change. You know, what happens with the debt markets is, is fundamental. What happens to the equity markets is fundamental. But the technology disruption is going to continue. And the question is, how do you play it? You know, how do you play yeah. that in terms of, you know, where you get your investment well, from, where the growth is, where the opportunities are? Well, it's are. interesting, Jeff. Technology disruption actually, some, I'm arguing, caused Trump to win. And let me explain. <laughs> Twitter, technology company in Silicon Valley, he used Twitter aggressively to differentiate himself. Um, Facebook, you mentioned some of the group thing, but that still was part of the social distribution. And some are saying that technology like Uber are putting people out of work in areas that don't get technology. So there's a backdrop and some narrative around, not that I agree with 100%, but there's a, there's a narrative around, hey, technology is eliminating jobs. I mean, Dave Vellante always talks about, will jobs be displaced? Where do they go? So I think you, you got a tech scene here, and I think Silicon Valley uh, is going to come out stronger from this, in my opinion, because of the epic fail of all times yeah. here in Silicon Valley with this election. I think people are going to rally and step up because Silicon Valley, this was the first time you start to see Silicon Valley be more political. The policies are being impacted. 
thoughts? Well, I mean, look, I, I've spent a number of years now running businesses that have gone through a process of globalizing. Right or wrong, they've gone through a process of globalizing. You know, a lot of U.S.-based jobs, now a lot of them are in China, a lot of them are in India. I mean, that's just the way it's been. And we've all adjusted to that reality. we figured out how do you develop products where you've got some people in California, you've got people in India, you might have people in China. And, you know, the economics are different, the behavior is different, but now that's how, how a lot of us do it. And we've also seen a lot of folks come here with the visa structure and so forth. The biggest question in my mind, not really short term, but over the next four years, is how does that change? How does it change the fundamentals operationally? And how does it change the behavior between different groups of people that are trying to work together in different parts of the world? And I think that's a big question mark. The second big one is what happens with, with debt, access to debt. Because in the mature technology industries like, like Dell with Silver Lake and now with the business that we, I was running, that we just sold to private equity, it was driven by uh, availability of cheap debt uh, mm -hmm. to a lot of a lot of companies right, in, right. in the private equity industry. Does that change? Does it get stronger? You know, so I think, um, you know, the dust needs to settle, but those in my mind are two of the biggest factors in technology that people aren't really focused on yet. Well, and the other thing is, who's he gonna put in positions of power, right? Mm -hmm. Who's gonna be his cabinet? You know, he gets to make a lot of assignments. They're talking about John Corzine, I think from Goldman, potentially in the treasury. So I think from a Wall Street and a business point of view, he's clearly, you know, a friend of business, but I think the leadership thing, but to your point, John, social, yeah. it's the Arab yeah. Spring. The, the voice the, con the voice is not singular anymore. It comes from all over. Yeah. So it could be lies, not lies, truths, but there's no single point. There's no Walter Cronkite that we all watch yeah. at six o'clock anymore. Yeah, and it, and it makes me actually want to do more politics and I was talking to Rob Hover, editor in chief, and like, you know, we have to get involved in the political conversation on siliconangle.com. We're going to look at that. We have the Tech Truth, obviously, which we're funding, the nonprofit. And this is important. I mean, I think the data is really critical. It's not not this, the New York Times anymore. It's not about those those papers, CNN. They're failed. They completely failed this election, mm. in my opinion. This is about data because now we're connected in a network. So that is the key. Now, yeah, I think you're right. I think it is also about people, though, too. I mean, I was in Dubai, what, six weeks ago? And the people I talked to, they didn't want to talk about the business. They wanted to talk about, are you idiots really going to elect this guy? <laughs> and, you know, I've gotten LinkedIn messages and tweets over the last couple of days like, what happened you know, right. from people in... UAE and places like that, that, you know, people that are really scared. And if I was still running the business I was running, I would be talking to my folks in India. I'd be talking to my folks in China saying, look, you know, we're, we're going to work together. Nothing is really well, it's changed an in terms of our relationship. It's an unprecedented right? election. If you look at this, and, and that's why the protests I'm not too hardcore on, because it was kind of an unconventional election. So the unconventional response is warranted, in my opinion. But you got to give Trump, uh, you know, a shot to look at what he can do. The thing about Trump is he went radical on, on, the, on the campaign because he had no other chance. He's underfunded. He was under, he had no chance of winning unless he took it to fighting style. And I think that was his strategy. He stuck with it. And hey, he won. The second thing is Trump was a Democrat. So he's got some liberal, he's also a businessman. So the question is, will he go radical right wing or will he be a centrist and do the right thing by not overplaying his hand on the Supreme Court to undermine Roe v. Wade? Will he come in and be pro-business, obviously building America, but not kill the international thing around protectionism? So this is what I'm looking at. And again, this is all going to thread back to Silicon Valley, right. back to Wall Street, back to business. And uh, you know, we're going to come back and talk about the vibes on the street after our, this break. And then we're going to get into our VC selection of the week, which is bullpen capital and we're going to try to get a hold of paul martino on the phone who's one of the partners over there let's so see if he's, he he picks up this is the silicon valley friday show i'm john furrier and be right back i remember when i had such a fantastic batting practice i walked by a couple of sports writers in that era hall of famer reggie jackson it was like you were rocking it out I, there i i, I kind of hope i didn't leave it out here reggie <laughs> <laughs> jackson when the game started I got back in that moment. I got back in what was live, what was now. Goodbye. I went and did a uh, something with ESPN earlier this year with Stephen Curry. They said, Reggie, we want you to come up and watch his practice, his pregame. You know, it was very similar to your batting practice where people come out and watch, etc. And I watched the dribbling exhibition. I watched the going between the legs and the behind the back and the fancy passing, etc. And I watched the shots. And the guy asked me what I thought of the show. And I said, well, it, it's a cool show, but I'm going to see all that tonight. He does all that. He brought I it said, into the game. Yeah, I said, so it, <laughs> it's, a, it's not a show, but that's his game. Mr. October. 
I think our world now with the instant gratification of, of sending out a message or tweeting to someone or some, whatever, certainly in the moment, uh, is about what our youth is and, and who we are today as, as a country, as a, as a universe. Congratulations, Reggie Jackson. You are CUBE alumni. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman. I've been an analyst with Wikibon and a co-host of the CUBE since 2010. It's been an exciting journey working with theCUBE. Uh, we get to go out to so many shows, help extract the signal from the noise, uh, interact with such a wide variety of, uh, of, of clientele, both practitioners, thought leaders, some big name uh, industry people, and we've helped some people uh, raise their profiles in there. Uh, especially love working with those practitioners. Uh, we've seen them move their careers forward and move their businesses forward as they take advantage of uh, technologies and practices uh, that they've learned. Talking with us, working with our research people and working with their peers. This is Stu Miniman, thanks for watching theCUBE. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Hey, you're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. My guests this week, Jeff Frick and Tom Joyce, uh, executive in the industry, uh, prospecting, looking for his next opportunity to run a company and or help the digital transformation. Guys, we just talked about the election. I'll see, <laughs> just didn't talk about it. But the other, the other thing I didn't mention was I had a one-on-one -on -one with Andy Jass. Talk about disruption. I had a one-on-one -on -one with him. Jeff, he's a sports fan. He's got a sports bar in his basement. <laughs> I know, I had a two-hour two hour conversation. Andy Jass, he's the CEO of Amazon Web Services, and he's awesome. He's just like, you know, has he's got the tiger by the tails. He's disrupting the world and actually has leveled the playing field because now it's a cloud game and he's just kicking ass and taking names. and. He was totally candid. Now, you know, I've interviewed Mark Hurd, Andy Jassy, all these execs, Michael Dell. Um, it's funny, they're all, it's all, they're all perfectly scripted, but here's the thing. I like to see who's got the good script and who can actually connect the dots and put some little bread, breadcrumbs out there. Andy Jassy uh, really did a great job. He stayed on message, but also shared a little bit about the future. And it's all about the cloud. It's like right, data center. Right, Why right. would you need a data center? Now you were just at Dell EMC. So, you know, they obviously they have data center business, but he's talking more long term. Thoughts on, on Did on, you ask him if he and Jeff are going to bring an NHL team to Seattle? I, did, I forgot to ask that question. <laughs> I was too busy trying to get some <laughs> okay, we'll move forward on looking statements from him, which, he, <laughs> which you'll see an article come out. I'm going to put a feature story on it. But this is about the next wave of disruption. Again, right, back to the right. whole election. The world has changed. The fact that Amazon Web Services, a book company, e-commerce company, now has one of the best infrastructure businesses, powering applications, powering you know social networks. These are the, this is the, this is what's going on. The election points to that, and this is all about the disruption. I mean, this is this is a massive disruption. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a wipeout, and I think it's a um, you know having been inside of HP for five years, inside of you know Dell for a year. What was interesting is, not to talk too much out of school, I, I'm a big fan of Microsoft. I actually prefer the Microsoft Cloud stuff to the AWS stuff, and I see you know, a big change in terms of how, how customers are actually adopting that. But in the business that I was running, I didn't spend any CapEx last year, because we were doing it all on Microsoft Cloud. Oh, that's amazing. So talk about that you know, decision, so I, Tom. Imagine that's, this, that's, I'm not gonna get in trouble with Michael Dell here, but I'm inside a server company. I didn't buy any servers for a year, why? Because I had a really distributed engineering organization with like 950 software engineers, right? And when we needed to do something new, we just spun it up on the cloud, right? Um, now there are opportunities to play that for hardware companies. There's different ways they have to do it. And there's a lot of customers who are gonna still buy hardware, but I didn't. Right. And right. Um, nothing held us back, you know? And that was a big yeah. change for how I would have done it, you know, two years ago or even one year ago. But yeah. you know, I, when I saw that, I'm like, Dude, this thing is this thing's over. All right. So your focus is now on innovation. It's getting those those guys productive. It's not on do we have enough storage? Do we have yeah. enough? Didn't have to think about it. Capacity. Just think yeah. about it. You listen to Tom Joyce, former Dell EMC executive, former executive at HP, and also EMC, and obviously Jeff Frick. Guys, this you know this segment really is also is where we do the VC of the week. And this week, our selection was between Sherpa Capital and, and Bullpen. I tweeted out last night, but uh, we're going to go with Bullpen Capital. Um, Paul Martino, the founder over there, Duncan Davis, also another partner. They've added more staff. But these guys were contrarians. In fact, Paul Martino predicted the election and uh, with Trump because he was, you know, Liz, he grew up in Bucks County, which is the bellwether, predicted every election. It kind of represents in, in, in Pennsylvania all the elections. So he had a gut feeling, but also he's a great entrepreneur. Paul Martino, founder of Bullpen Capital, 
is what I call blue collar entrepreneur. He was started Tribe, one of the first social networks. He sees things early. He's got a great gut instinct. Invested in Zynga. He's he invested in FanDuel early. Saw that whole trend towards the democratization. Super smart guy. Graduated from Princeton, computer science. But he's kind of a blue collar hustler, and he recognizes hard work. Lives on the East Coast, but kind of a contrarian. Started Bullpen Capital because of all the seed capital coming in. He created a nice bridge formation where he actually funds companies that get the hustle going but aren't VC ready, meaning the VCs, you know, they all, it used to be like when, when VCs would look at a deal, oh, that's got hair on it. That's a term that they say, meaning it's got baggage or, or, or a bad capital structure or, you know, it might not have the growth trajectory. Paul's team actually looks at that in the, in the spirit of betting and hustle and say, hey, you know, I like that company. We're going to come in and formally bridge you. So he's played a big role in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, but he's also got a good sense of that. So Bullpen Capital is doing some great work there. You know, I think I think my critique of them is they don't do enough of it, and they're and they got to get out more action in Silicon Valley and, and and more on the East Coast. So that's kind of my take on them. Thoughts on on your guys and the, the formation of uh, the VC world and how that impacts. Well, it's just interesting. It used to be a very short list of of top VCs, right? It was Kleiner, it was Sequoia, there's a few more, and then it fell off. And we've seen, especially on the enterprise side, a lot of guys that are younger, they're hustling. It's not kind of the traditional group, and as we've talked about on other shows, John, they're out working. You know, people aren't coming to them all the time. They're out at AWS reInvent. They're out at these big shows. They're looking for the innovation. So I think it is a hustler's market. Uh, my only comment on Philly is we got to do a cube gig in Philly. I've been waiting to do a cube gig at Philly. I talked to Josh think, at First Round Capital. We got to do a cube gig at Philly. So we got to. Uh, work Paul's away. had his success and failures, but he's made a lot of money recently. So I think he's actually got a box, and, and he's a big Phillies fan. So we should talk to him about that. But but the blue <laughs> but the blue collar thing is interesting because if you look at Y Combinator, I once said when Y Combinator came out from Boston here, I said it's the community college of entrepreneurship. Yeah. And I, I didn't mean it as a negative. I meant it as, you know, the elite schools like the Ivies and Stanford, you go there and the VCs very clubby, clubby, uh, traditionally been clubby in the in, in here. And that they would, you have to get a, through a recommendation. And then what you saw in the past 10 years with Web 2.0 and now with cloud is that anybody can start a company. An immigrant coming to the United States, it could be a young entrepreneurship that's not on everyone's radar that can become a rock star literally overnight. And I think that's the key. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's interesting to me when I, uh, I haven't really dealt with the VC community for about a year and a half, two years, and, you know, in that period of time, everything changes like five times. But stepping back into it and having, you know, a lot of meetings with folks, um, what I also see, though, is a lot of the larger established VCs stepping down and trying to do more seed um, and, and not taking as many of the big bets, trying to get earlier into some of these things. And they're not always really well set up to compete with guys like this who are right. really, you know, capable of doing it retail on the ground, spending time with people. Um, you know, I think the, the seed market is a tough market. You got to have a good nose. For the, you got to have a good nose Plus, for the deal. It's hard to put a billion dollars to work at seed at seed yeah. transaction levels. It's just a transaction. The, the but they are going to compete with some of the folks that have been doing seed and angel investing to a greater and greater extent. Yeah, but yeah. but you got to get past the seed run. I think that's what bullpen's done, and the, and the, the best winners now are coming in the seed, and, the, and they're going what I call cradle to grave. Like an Andreessen Horowitz plays this. They get early and they take it all the way through, and they don't share. And it used to be a sharing culture. Um, so let's. Let's, let's try to call Paul up on a, on a cell on a cell phone. See if he can see if he picks up. I mean, Paul is like I call him the Reed Hoffman of of uh, uh, blue collar entrepreneurship because Reed Hoffman is the founder of one of the social networks. Paul was also one of the founders of one of the first social networks. And just get all the credit that, that the Reed Hoffman gets. But let's see if we can get Paul on the phone here. Okay, got my little blue cube. <laughs> okay, let's see if it picks up. Hello. Hello. Hey, Paul Martino. Yeah, what's up? John Furrier, you're on the Silicon Valley Friday show with Jeff Frick and my guest, Tom Joyce, former executive at EMC, HP Dell, looking for work, talking to VCs. Hey, you got uh, you got a second? Uh, long time no see, Furrier. <laughs> I appreciate the call. <laughs> okay, what's going on? So we're just highlighting Bullpen Capital as the VC of the week, talking about how cool you are 
uh, and uh, your firm's doing a great job. We had some critique on you, talk behind your back, but you can check that out later. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad I picked up the phone. <laughs> you know, that's that's why we're going to make it up to you. So, Paul, look, at, I just want to just get you on because we've been talking about the election as well, all all in the intros. That's pretty much the news. I did kind of weave in the, the one of the big things that happened this week was overshadowed by that was my one on one with Andy Jassy up in Seattle this week for two hour exclusive interview, um, not videotape, but it was going to come out on a post about this massive disruption we're seeing right now. I mean, the election points to it. I've been watching your Facebook feed. You called it. You've been seeing the trends. You grew up in Bucks County, which calls all the elections. You had a good sense of this. And, you know, as an investor, you've made some good bets, too. What, what's your take on this? I and mean, where, where did you see the action coming from that gave you the indication that this was possible? Yeah, so, look, at heart, at heart, I am more contrarian than anything. People say, are you a liberal, are you a conservative, that kind of stuff. But really, if I can ascribe to an ideology, it's contrarian. And so... Clearly, from a Silicon Valley perspective, the Trump election is as contrarian as it could have possibly been. But if you were looking at the data with kind of a dispassionate set of eyes, you could absolutely see that this could have happened. So I actually wrote to my partners the day of the election. I said, look, I, I, I've been crunching the models. And uh, John, I know you know this background, but I'm a high performance computing and predictive modeling guy. So big data. I did my PhD work in that. This is the world I come from. So I sent the, the following note to my partners the day of the election. I said, look, I think the trading markets have this wrong. I think Trump's about a one in three shot. I think Hillary is in the lead, but he's about a one in three shot. And oh, by the way, if he wins, he's going to with over 300 electoral votes because the Rust Belt is going to vote in a correlated way. And so that's basically the letter I said to my guys. And my guys then, of course, you know, once the election happened, said, how come nobody else anywhere sent a note like this? And literally, I mean, you read the pundits, yeah. you read Huffington Post, not a single person said that. And I don't think it was that I was so much smarter than the other people. I think I was able to check my biases at the door and just look at the data, which, oh, by the way, is the same kind of way we pick our, our companies at Bullpen. Hey, uh, Paul, Jeff Frick here. Question for you. You would think after Trump went from last place out of 17 people, uh, to win the Republican um, candidacy that maybe people would have said, you know, he's not such a long shot as it may appear on the surface. But that didn't seem to factor in at all. Absolutely right. And you know what? The one guy who actually saw that and, and apologized to some extent was then Tillery Ford. So Nate Silver, he basically <clears throat> got the Trump uh, primary totally wrong. He said, my bad. And then, even though he's a bit on the left, he started looking more at the data. And the weekend before the election, he had Trump as a, almost the same number I did. He had Trump at about 35%. But he was pilloried. The guy from the Huffington Post goes, Nate Silver, you're being irresponsible. He is at most a 1% to 2% chance to win. And every other model's got, got a 90% plus. What the hell is wrong with you? And, and he bent and he cowed to it. And then he changed his model to about 16 18% the day of the election. Paul. But, but it's funny. You can almost see that he had it right and he didn't have the courage to stick with it. This is about again, the courage. Again, putting all the biases at the door. I love how you said that because, again, I was the same way because, you know, I live in Silicon Valley. And, you know, I'm from the party of business. That's I'm, I'm, I guess I'm kind of a contrarian too, but I'm a, I'm a blue collar guy myself. Um, and I like to check my bias at the door because I don't like to make a bet. I'm in the party of business. I want to, I want to make money. I want to grow and things. So, so I got to get your take on this. I mean, this is about the media failure. We have a seven year old self-funded media business, Silicon Angle Media, 35 employees and growing, kicking ass, taking names again, yep. contrarian, true, but the media fail here is an epic fail, in my opinion. You point out some of the biases. I mean, I just saw this morning Trump, uh, I mean, CNN had a, a, a staged interview with protesters. I mean, the, the bias on the media here has been out of control. And you looked at the data as if you were a reporter. Now, you're not. You're just you're in the investment business. But this was a media fail. Your thoughts on that? I know you've been sharing some links. Uh, I, John, I couldn't agree with you more. And I know you and I have, have gone back and forth on various Facebook posts about this. Uh, and what's really funny now in the aftermath, you had about half the journalists who were wrong write a, God, what was I, you know, uh, a wake up, I, I need to get out of my bubble. And, you know, I must admit, I really appreciate that. The, the, the people who said, you know, us being all in for Hillary, being in our own bubble was really a problem. But, you know, it scares me, and then we'll get to why the bias happened. There's this other half of them that doubled down. I mean, to me, there's now a portion of the press that is completely hopeless. You know, the editor of The New Yorker writes this article at 2.40 in the morning after it happened, which is basically like, you know, 
all these awful people in the country made this happen. You know, everybody go to hell, basically. You know, but other people, the guy from CBS yesterday wrote an article basically saying, hey, you know, we had a systematic failure here. We better, we better look at ourselves as to why this happened, how we let this happen. You know, maybe making fun of those people in the, in the Midwest who had lost their jobs, were struggling with drug addiction, and had no hope, saying, check your white privilege at the door. Maybe that wasn't the best strategy for reaching out to them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. And, and again, this, the, the impact, though, also is, is, is catastrophic. And we were talking last week on our show about the WikiLeaks. And, and I said to Jeff, not one of those WikiLeaks has been debunked, meaning no one's come out and said they've been doctored. But it brought up a different issue, which is now getting back to data science and data. We're now living in a social network. You started one of the first social networks. Now, you know, I was saying earlier, giving you props that you're like the, the Reed Hoffman that nobody knows. You're out there. You've been a pioneer and a contrarian and successful. But if you look at the data, right, if you look at this and say, where's the data? Okay, that is the, the key right now. And so the impact of WikiLeaks was there wasn't a smoking gun, but the data was was reinforcing what what you were saying around people's perception. So this is going to not just be for politics, Paul, this is going to impact a lot of things. And I know you funded FanDuel, which was a really radical approach with kicking ass and the betting systems and all these kind of social technologies. What does this mean for technology intersecting with social justice and social good and political science? Your thoughts on that? Right. So, so look, obviously getting hacked is not exactly a great outcome, but getting hacked has led to a level of transparency that should have otherwise been available to us. And I think that's what the lesson is going to be. The lesson is going to be, if you know that you can get hacked, or if you know that there's cameras, or you know that there's a world in which information is way more readily available than you think it is, which maybe it is. being transparent about what you're up to is the only viable strategy forward going. I mean, we adopt this as our strategy right on our website. Uh, we put on our website, here's the three things you need if you're going to be a bullpen company. Here's how we pick our companies. I can't tell you the number of people said to me, well, Paul, isn't that your secret sauce? Isn't that the proprietary technology? I'm like, yeah, it is, but I'm going to tell you what it is. And if you think you're better at it than me, go right ahead and try and do it. You know, I just, I just think that if it's got to be proprietary what you're doing, in the long run, your advantage just does not exist. If you can't tell them what you're doing and do it because you're better than them, you've got, you got, you got a really hard future in the new world. Yeah, Paul, we're going to come back on break. We're going to hold you on the line, but that's exactly what Andy Jassy and I are talking about. Open always wins. Open always wins. And scale matters. And, you know, and, and having the best product. That's Paul Martino on the phone. He's going to stay on with us. We're going to take a short break right now on uh, to go to our sponsors. We'll be right back with more after the short break with Paul Martino, Jeff Frick, and Tom Joyce. Great conversation. Paul, stay on the line. We'll be right back. Since the dawn of big data, awesome. the Cube has been there, connecting with executives, practitioners, entrepreneurs, Thought leaders. But you're not a thought leader anymore, you're a futurist. That's the new trend. The futurist is the buzzword. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm very much living in the past. <laughs> I don't like the future. And I don't think much of the present. And John Cleese. There, there's a lot of people out there who have no idea what they're doing, but they have absolutely no idea that they have no idea what they're doing. And those are the ones with the confidence of stupidity who finish up in power. That's why the planet doesn't work knowledgeable, insightful, and a true gentleman. And the guy at the counter recognized me and said, are you listening? Yes, I'm tweeting away. So you're not I tweet, tweet. I'm tweeting away. He just got rude that way, but. keyboard. <laughs> John Cleese joins the Cube alumni. Welcome, John. You got any phone calls you need to answer? Hold on, let me check. The Cube is a comfortable place. You come inside the Cube and we have a conversation, uh, almost as if it were a, a, a chance meeting, and we have a, a discussion about a particular topic. Our philosophy is everybody's expert at something. Everybody's passionate about something and has real deep knowledge about that something. Well, we want to focus in on that area and extract that knowledge and share it with our community. So folks who have never heard of it before come in the Cube and say, wow, this is really cool what you guys are doing. It's unique, it adds value to the community, and it adds value by really sharing information. I can't tell you how many people stop me at conferences or on the streets, on our airports, say, hey, I love your show. People that I've never met before, they say to me, I know you, you don't know me. I watch the Cube, I queue up your videos, I listen to them while I'm on the, the treadmill. You know, it helps me, you know, learn expands my knowledge, you know, thank you. So 
you know, it's really an honor to be part of that community. This is Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching The Cube. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. And Seth. <laughs> You listen to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier, and joining me today is Jeff Frick and Tom Joyce, and special call-in VC of the week, Paul Martino, who picked up. And when the benefit of picking up is we don't trash you behind your back, <laughs> uh, and we get some commentary. Yep. Paul, thanks for spending the time. We appreciate it uh, coming on. Appreciate that. Very good. Thank you. Uh, we just we had a great commentary in that last segment around the impacted election, and, and you know, really appreciate your commentary as. Uh, uh, a, a geek in data analytics, and you get your PhD in this area, high-scale computing. Um, we, now I want to talk about the impact in, uh, of technology. Obviously, the election behind us. The, the game has certainly changed. The trajectory of our country is going to be shifting. And you know, I always said to people on Facebook, if you don't get involved, you're part of the problem, not the solution. So you know, it's an opportunity to let Trump go do his thing. We'll keep a critical eye on him, certainly with Silicon Angle. But more importantly, it's game on for a new trajectory, and we're going to see how it plays out. But the impacts. Um, are unknown, and certainly there will be impact on Silicon Valley, there's going to be impact on technology, there's going to be an impact on ratings, which we touched on. Guys, let's talk about this segment, the impact on uh, Silicon Valley, technology, globalization. Paul's on the East Coast in, in Philly. Um, we're here in Silicon Valley in our little bubble that's now been busted up. Um, <laughs> It's a global, the world is flat. I saw Thomas Friedman at the IBM event, you know, and, and we, we, this is now happening. Thoughts? Yeah, nothing, nothing is safe. I mean, John, you said the right word. The Silicon Valley bubble has been popped in this regard, and I don't think anything healthier could have happened than that. Uh, I post One of the things I posted on my webpage once this happened, kind of out, out to my friends in Silicon Valley, I said, you got to remember the, the Mike Tyson quote, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> and to some extent, it's once you get punched in the mouth, once you get your bubble burst, once you realize that there's other world around you, the way you behave in these situations really tells you who you are. As as an investor and board member, it's in a situation like this, I want to see how my CEO operates now. When everything's hunky-dory, great, up and to the right, you know, you definitely have a different person than when you're in a spot where you got punched in the face. So I'm, I'm actually quite interested to see how a lot of disillusioned and upset Silicon Valley CEOs operate now that they realize there is another world out there. Yeah, it's a great point. Tom Joyce was actually t commenting on our opening segment that, you know, a lot of the young kids who are protesting never lost before or seen it, an epic loss before. And he was commenting, we have, Paul, you were talking about, I, I mean, Tom, you were talking about that notion of just getting back to work versus all the cuddling going on. People are sending memos out saying, it's okay, like it's a tragedy, an, an election and a democracy was a tragedy. And, and, and all this cuddling at all these the universities, it's ridiculous. Like, like it's an election, this is how the system works. It's a land of laws, you might not like it, but get up and get involved. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I, I, we all, I have kids, right? You know, the first instinct is, all right, how do I explain this to my kid who's sitting next to me and the other one's in college at a big party to celebrate Hillary Clinton, right? They haven't experienced this before, but, the next day I realized, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to work and I'm going to do my job and I'm going to figure out how to play this. And I'm going to watch closely. And the message to them is kind of go to school because, I mean, frankly, Mondale didn't win. Dukakis didn't win. And the, the country went on. And yeah, I'll tell you what pisses me off the most, to be honest with you, no matter what side you are on. The people who are saying, I'm going to go to Canada, that's BS. You know, you're either you're an American, or you're a patriot or you're not. And, you know, we all ha kind of have to pull our bootstraps up and, and get going forward. And I think, you know, the comment about the entrepreneurs is key. I mean, day one after the market fell apart in 2008, I was sitting in a startup that couldn't raise money. All right, what do I do now? And this yeah. isn't that bad. It's adversity. It's, it's dealing right, with the dynamic right. nature similar. of the world. I mean, this is the disruption. So the disruption, What do I do now? To Paul's point is how you act will define who you are as a person and a leader. And so, Paul, what's your what's your take on that? I mean, what do you advise? Well, I saw I'll tell you one thing. I will tell you one thing that upset me a couple of years ago and really upset me yesterday. And I think this is something everybody, left, right, center, contrarian, not contrarian, FOMO guy in Silicon Valley needs to, to get on board with. And the Grubhub CEO comes out and basically says, hey, look, you know, you Trump supporters, uh, you know, you can feel free to resign. And if you guys remember what happened to the CEO of Mozilla a couple of years ago because of a campaign contribution, a campaign contribution to a stance that the, then President Obama had. He was, he was ousted by his board as the result of a political contribution. And the Grubhub CEO, and it, it's unclear how explicit he was about saying Trump supporters need to resign from my company. 
we need to all get together and say that behavior is unacceptable. That is un-American. That is un-Silicon Valley. That is un-meritocracy. Uh, you know, we, we, we need to make sure we embrace everyone. We talk about diversity. Well, what about diversity of political opinion? That's got to be on the list, too. And I, I, I'm really strong on this topic. I will not tolerate that from my CEOs. I don't think anybody in Silicon Valley should tolerate a thought police firing people because of who they voted for. You know, that's exactly the, the – you know what? You brought up a good point, and that was Derek Elitch. Or EH or whatever he's, a, but he also invented JavaScript. So it's not like he was just like some suit. The guy was a player. And by the way, he donated ten grand, which is in the scheme of things is like like pennies these days, right? It's ten grand. It's like you know writing a check to to uh, you know anybody. I mean, yeah. the guy from Facebook donated thirty four million dollars to have Hillary elected. Thirty four million. Yeah, the so, thing that that gets me is is I think Paul, what you touched on is we've lost the ability to have civil discourse with difference of opinions and have a conversation about it and agree to disagree. And now it becomes this inflated thing, regardless of the size. Yeah, but the double we've, standard. We've lost that. Well, that's, no, the double that's standard is brutal. He's a double standard. He's Absolutely. talking about people who play the diversity card uh, in an angry way, but yet don't balance it out on the other side. And that's what the journalists didn't do either. I and mean, this is a huge issue, this whole you know, Mozilla guy and then the Grubhub, whatever his name is. Uh, I just heard rumblings about that. It's unacceptable. It doesn't foster any collaboration. It just separates and creates silos. And, and more, less transparent environment. I mean, that's, to me, huge issue. Paul, thoughts? Yeah, boy, when you can live in your own echo chamber, this is what can happen. You know, I've had some of our CEOs raise really big rounds ahead of milestones. And the, I have this very special conversation with those CEOs. The day you believe what you're worth is the result of this financing, I'm going to put my foot in your you-know-what. <laughs> and I'm going to be the guy calling you out every single day when you start believing your own BS. And, and you know what? I think that's a real service to do to those CEOs. For example, in a hot company, as it's up and to the right and everything is perfect, you need somebody in the room saying, hey, maybe everything isn't so perfect or maybe all this data isn't so good. I talked to a friend of mine who was a Democrat strategist here in Pennsylvania yesterday, and he said a lot of the ads that were run here in Pennsylvania were explicitly directed at women, explicitly directed at the gauche behavior of Donald Trump. And, and he said at one of the meetings, he said, you know, maybe we should make some ads to talk to the men of Pennsylvania, too. Maybe we should make some ads talking about Mike Pence and his positions. And they all said, no, get out of the room. We don't need that opinion. We're going to stick with this strategy. You know, we don't need you in this meeting. That's the kind of behavior that, that potentially calls for in the campaign because Pennsylvania was so important. That's the kind of behavior when I see it in my startups, I get yeah. furious at the CEO for enabling to happen. Paul, so let's talk about venture capital and funding in the, the marketplace and media. Obviously, Jeff and, and I have been riffing on the NFL ratings going down. This all points to a couple of disruptions going on. One is new opportunity, new entrants entering the market. You funded FanDuel, seed financing. Um, there's a lot of other competition for NFL, people are on Snapchat 24-7, Mindshare and other things. Thoughts on investing in this disruption and your thoughts on the NFL ratings? Well, so first half, there, is, there are always disruptions inside of our ecosystem. The, the level of groupthink and venture capital as a whole is very similar to the level of groupthink in Silicon Valley. And so there are always contrarian opportunities in venture capital, either by looking at out-of-favor categories, companies in out-of-favor geographies, or looking at founders with non-traditional backgrounds. You go look at all of the really successful stuff in our portfolio. Husband and wife team starts a fantasy sports company in Edinburgh, Scotland. That's called FanDuel. Uh, you know, uh, a talent scout and a cocktail waitress form a cosmetics company. That's Ipsy. Right? These are our best companies. Companies formed in L.A. and Edinburgh by people with not exactly the traditional kinds of background. Yeah. And you know what's, what's common about these companies is a lot of other venture people didn't give them the right time of day because they didn't fit the pattern. Uh, and, you know, we just capitalize on the fact that those kind of built-in biases are across the system. Yeah. So what do you want to know about uh, the NFL? How can I help you on that one? Well, John? first of all, we believe in the contrarian. We're, we're a media company founded by people who had no media degrees of any kind. Um, but uh, NFL has been talking about... 
<laughs> By your standard, we're, we're, an, we're still an outlier, though. We're still contrarian. Um, outliers are key. Obviously, that's a success. We've seen that. NFL is not an outlier. They've been doubling down on their their billion dollars. Certainly, I'm a Tom Brady fan, so I, I am not a big uh, NFL fan. But the ratings are down, and they're scratching their head going, what right. the hell's going on? They blame on? the election. They blame baseball. There's a lot of blame. But all those excuses are gone, and I don't think it's going to change. Is it, a, is it a condition of just uh, uh, attention, or is there, is there underlying causes to this? your opinion so, so I've, I've been able to see data on this as a result of being involved with FanDuel and so I'm not on the board any longer but of course I still stay in touch with the companies and when you have that kind of exposure to the asset which FanDuel does as a result of its uh, of its uh, product certainly you see, see data and we saw this immediately and this trend of viewership it did not change from weeks one to nine you know, if this was the first week or two was a blip, you'd, you'd think one thing. But this is now nine, ten weeks straight, and and I think there are two reasons that the NFL is somewhat unwilling to admit is behind this. Oh, it's the election. Oh, it's sector. Oh, the baseball was really good this year. I think that's I think that's not right. I think there's a real change in the quality of the product because of parity brought to the league. And oh, dare I say this? Maybe it's safer to say now. The Colin Kaepernick protest turned off a lot of people, probably in that rust belt that voted for Donald Trump. Call me crazy. <laughs> Well, too, well, you know, yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, look, go just the, the, the consumption patterns, to me, it seems like it's That's kind of, it's bipolar, right? You're either totally into your fantasy and you watch your app and you watch your guy score points throughout the day, or you go to Red Zone. Why would I go to Fox or CBS or NBC when I can watch Red Zone commercial free? Well, I, th I think there's that. And, you know, I think the other thing is my, my, my son and all his friends, they play football. My son's the captain of the football team, plays every down, doesn't watch football on TV, doesn't watch anything on TV. They can't get him to watch TV. Why is that? Just because he's distracted? That's not the medium they consume things right. through anymore. They just don't want to do it. They don't want to sit in one They're room cord and watch cutters. TV. Right, They've right. cut the cord. And, you know, it's funny to me, just to, just to say, knowing nothing about this and having no data, the, the folks that were ahead of it were like world wrestling. You know, they were using the technology early. The NFL's not – they've been beholden to the well, old Paul, model. He, Paul, well, Paul brings up the point right. about the Kaepernick. The anything. Kaepernick reinforces the, the vibe, which is I want entertainment. I love football. I don't want politics jammed down my throat. Well, I think that's I mean, a that, big that, factor that, that is short term. A, it might not be the, the reason, but I think he might be right on this, that you know whether you agree with him or not, he this is an issue. Wait, wait a minute. I want to watch football, not some bullshit media <laughs> thing. I mean, that's a, I mean, one of the virtues of sports – and oh, by the way, let's talk about how good esports is and all the stuff you just said the NFL is not good at. Esports. I yeah. was at the League of Legends semifinal, and the final was in New York just just a couple weeks ago. They built this for a millennial audience. They understood the medium in the way that UFC and WWE did, and and the NFL, since they make so much money on broadcast linear television, they're stuck with it's it. It's difficult. They're the one that's going to get disrupted because they're the incumbent. The newcomers can disrupt them with the new mediums. But you talk to people who are 16, 18 years old; they've never watched a game from beginning to end. They'll, they'll go watch all the clips and talk about all the plays, but they didn't watch the game end end. So it's more than cord cutting. It's actually the way in which it's consumed. I think that's right. It's yeah. completely fantasy. non-linear fantasy. fantasy. It's fantasy. All this points to the right. friggin' non-linear. Yeah, so if the, if the Colin Kaepernick thing goes away, right, I don't think the dynamic changes. No, I think they I have a fundamental well, long-term problem. I think, it's, I think it's like WikiLeaks. It's not a smoking gun, but it's a reinforcement of the, the core audience, which is like people who aren't on. So I think that's one. No, yeah. I'm just got, what I'm getting at is I think they had erosion at both the young and the old side. Yeah. There was an erosion at the young side for all of the <laughs> primary reasons that we're talking about, but there was an erosion of people at the more 65 and up Rust Belt area because of the following, and that's why the drop was perhaps as, as precipitous as it was. If it was one of those, maybe it'd be down a few points, but the fact that they lost younger and older people all at the same time, that's surprising. And if you look, the drop in demographics is across the board as opposed to just the young people. And that's also why maybe the quality of the product and the parity in the league is something to look at as well. Paul Martino, thanks for, for uh, taking the call and really riffing with us. Really appreciate the commentary and all the insight was phenomenal. And, and the obviously discussions, the impact would be great. Love to bring you back for another segment. I wanted to talk about the blue collar entrepreneurship trend that's going on that we talked about last week. We have to do that another time. Thanks so much for, for, for picking up. Appreciate it. Pleasure being on with all of you. Thank you for the time. All right, Paul Martino. Thanks, Paul.
Uh, Paul Martino, great entrepreneur. I mean, he's, you can tell he's an entrepreneur, right? So let's, let's wrap up the show. Massive disruption. You know, he's a passionate entrepreneur. He's not a VC. He's not, even though he got a PhD from Princeton and a technical degree, he's not the, he's not your, you know, old, you know, Harvard MBA, Stanford MBA, you know, elite VC. He's mm -hmm. a hustler. He's been an entrepreneur and now very successful picking contrarian companies. This is the model. This is the outliers are now the, the new Standard. Yep. Guys, disruption. Let's wrap this up. Election, what it all means. Good, Tom. Well, you know, I think the election creates a bunch of unknowns, but you know, again, my point of view is the trend we're on from a technology standpoint is is really kind of unchanged. It's a question of how, how do you play it short term? How do you deal with the financing issues, with the financing environment is going to change? How do you deal with the internationalization? I think that's a big factor for most of these companies, which are already global and integrated and have people from all different kinds of cultures. And that needs to be managed really, really well. If I'm a CEO, if I'm a manager at every level, any level, I'm talking to all my people like you. You said not shutting people out, but being inclusive and bringing in the yeah. customers and employees around the world. I mean, that's that's step number one. And and then all you can do at our level, certainly at my level, is is to hope yeah. and be hopeful and, and that Trump can somehow you know pull well, this, this is through bigger and do than, a this great is, job. I this mean, is that's bigger, what a patri this, patriotism this is, why, is about. This is why I'm on this, and this is why I'm focusing on this. Not to highlight Trump's win and and and, and support him that way, but it's more of highlighting. That and, and today's Veterans Day, by the way. So you know, thanks to all the veterans, this country is about freedom, right? It this is. country is about choice and freedom. Uh, it has laws. He won. Let's see what he does. He was a liberal. He was a Democrat. Maybe he will go to the middle and surprise us all by putting in the right Supreme Court and do the right thing. But what Paul Martino was talking about is, and Jeff, we've been talking about is that the entire world is changing. You can use every example. How people consume NFL football. The millennials, they're the ones protesting. Most of the people protesting are the younger generation that's never seen a loss in an election. You're seeing nonlinear non TV like The Cube and what we're doing. You're seeing cable collapsing. ESPN didn't hit their numbers. <laughs> New York Times, the, the the paper of the authority of record has failed miserably. The selection highlights venture capital thing that he's talking about. This is the this is the new disruption. It's changing the consumption of life. Yeah, and I think you know life is not easy. Life is hard, and I think a couple of the topics today that are really important today. You need to seek out the other point of view. You need to seek it out. It's not going to come to you based on your recommendation engine. Seek it out. Look at other news sources. Read other people's opinion. Uh, you, you really need to do that. And um, and, and then you got to go to work. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, if yeah. you don't get the negative, you're not going to learn what's really the problem. It. You got to you got to seek at, seek that out. Don't read your own headlines and buy into it. Before right? we end the this, this show today, Tom, I want to give you a chance to share your thoughts. What's going on in Silicon Valley? What's the observations? You know, as we get past this shock and gloom and talk about the optimism of what's possible, the world's changing this. It's still going to go on. What's the what are, what are the things you're looking at? What are the cool things that you see? Man, you know, it's super fun for me right now to go out and talk to folks and look at things, and it's really encouraging. I mean, this this area is just such a hotbed of activity and creativity, and you know, so it's I'm enjoying it. I'm still in the early stages. I can kind of take as long as I want, but there's a lot of smart people doing cool yeah. stuff. I do think though that there is a lot more investment in hard problems hard technology. Yeah. I think the days of, hey, we created an app and it's not yeah. really fundamentally, that, that stuff's all dead. Uh, I think the the smart VCs are really trying to find hard problems that are truly changes in how the, the technology works. And so, you know, regardless of Trump or the NFL or no, anything there's else, an exciting changes. I think that there's an acceleration yeah. happening in terms of yeah. real hard technology. Well, certainly the political, yeah. the political science world is awesome right now. Social science is awesome. These are areas that are bursting with solutions that are needed. And I think the young people are pumped and they want to just get past and understand the future. Certainly, you know, we love transportation is being disrupted here in Silicon Valley. So even though the bubble was burst a little bit, which I would kind of agree with Paul on, Silicon Valley will always survive. It's always going to be inventing. It's a very and awesome reinventing place. Reinventing and reinventing. Reinventing. And then people got to just check their bias at the door, move on with their life. Get to work. And have some fun. Go to work. This is the Go Silicon Valley. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. We're doing our share. Going to work. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks for listening. And uh, subscribe. Share. Share the love. Share the podcast. Share the videos. I'm Sean Furrier. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show.